Sergeant Lugo, could you please start your PC recording? PC recording done. Cloud is rolling. Good evening. Welcome to the remote hearing of the New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform. Everyone, please turn on your video at this time. Silence all electronic devices. All written testimony can be submitted at nyc.gov slash property tax reform slash testimony. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the live transcript icon on the bottom of the Zoom menu bar. Thank you. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Today's Zoom hearing is the third of five borough-based hearings on the preliminary report of the Advisory Commission. Virtual hearings are also scheduled for the Bronx on June 14th and Manhattan on June 16th. All hearings will begin at 6 p.m. A Staten Island hearing occurred on May 11th and a Brooklyn hearing occurred on May 27th. If you are unable to attend your borough's hearings, please know that members of the public may attend any hearing regarding, regardless of their home borough. As a reminder, all people wishing to testify must register on the Advisory Commission's website at least 24 hours prior to the start of the hearings. Also, for members of the public who are listening who would like to submit written testimony, they may do so at any time at nyc.gov slash property tax reform slash testimony. 37 people have signed up to testify tonight and 29 Queen residents have submitted written testimony, some of whom are also presenting oral testimony. Before we begin with the public testimony, I wanna say thank you to all the members of the public who submitted written testimony, as well as those here tonight who are taking the time out of their schedules to testify on the Advisory Commission's preliminary report. We value what each of you has to say, so please know that even if we don't directly respond to your testimony today, we are listening and your testimony will be part of our deliberations. With 37 people registered to testify tonight, it's in the interest of time that we cannot respond individually. In January 2020, the Commission released 10 preliminary recommendations to reform the property tax system. Hearings were initially planned to begin in March 2020, but delayed due to, due to, due to COVID-19. We request that the public testimony specifically respond to the Commission's 10 recommendations. I will now read the Commission's 10 preliminary recommendations. One, the Commission recommends moving co-ops, condominiums, and rental buildings with up to 10 units into a new residential class along with one to three family homes. The property tax system would continue to consist of four classes of property, residential, large rentals, utilities, and commercial. Two, the Commission recommends using a sales-based methodology to value all properties in the residential class. Three, the Commission recommends assessing every property in the residential class at its full market value. Four, the Commission recommends that annual market value changes in the new residential class be phased in over five years at a rate of 20% per year, and that assessed value growth caps should be eliminated. The Commission recommends creating a partial homestead exemption for primary resident owners with income below a certain threshold. The exemption would be available to all eligible primary resident owners in the residential class and would replace the current condo co-op tax abatement. Sixth, the Commission recommends creating a circuit breaker within the property tax system to lower the property tax burden on low-income primary resident owners based on the ratio of property tax paid to income. Seven, the Commission recommends replacing the current class share system with a system that prioritizes predictable and transparent tax rates for property owners. The new system would freeze the relationship of tax rates among the tax classes for five-year periods, after which time the city would conduct a mandated study to analyze if adjustments need to be made to maintain consistency in the share of taxes relative to the fair market value borne by each tax class. Eight, the Commission recommends the current valuation methods should be maintained for properties not in the new residential class, that is, rental buildings with more than 10 units, utilities, and commercial. The Commission recommends a gradual transition to the new system for current owners, with an immediate transition into the new system whenever a property in the new residential class is sold. And finally, 10, the Commission recommends instituting comprehensive reviews of the property tax system every 10 years. I'd now like to introduce to the public the other members of the commission. Um, we are going to go in alphabetical order as we always do, which allows Alan Capelli to go first, even though we're not on Staten Island. Um, and Alan, I turn it over to you to say hello and introduce yourself. Even though I'm not on Staten Island, 
I have worked for the citizens of Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn as well. Uh, very happy to hear your testimony. The system is inequitable. We're listening to what you say. Uh, we have sensible uh, recommendations, but if you have better suggestions, we will follow them. So please let us hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, next up is Carol Carrican. Hi, good, good Carl evening. I'm sorry, I'm not muted anymore, I don't think. I'm Carol O'Claricon, and I'm an economist by training. And I am at the moment a uh, adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. But I have been, uh, in the past, New York City's finance commissioner and budget director, and so have been steeped in the property tax for better and for worse. Um, it's a pleasure, really, to be here tonight. I am a co-op owner of Long Standing in Manhattan since about 1980. Um, so I know those issues and problems as well. I have read all the testimony that's been submitted so far, and I look forward to hearing more from you. And I want to uh, reinforce Alan's uh, comment that we are listening very hard and paying close attention. And I thank you very much for your efforts by being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, next up, we have Ken Ken Kenneth Knuckles, um, although I don't see him on my screen. So is, is, are you here, Ken? OK, so I believe Ken Knuckles will be joining us a little, a little later. So um, finally, we have um, James Parrott, um, our other commissioner. James? Good evening. James Parrott is my name. I'm Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. And uh, like uh, Alan and Carol, I too look very much forward to hearing the testimony this evening and want to assure all listeners that we are uh, very committed to producing uh, an actionable set of recommendations by the end of this year, uh, those recommendations will be need will will need to be acted upon by Albany, and we really uh, look and and look forward to having the support of all New York City elected officials in Albany in um, managing to get the city's recommendations through Albany. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, our, our last commissioner, Elizabeth Velez, will not be able to attend the meeting today. So um, before I turn it over to our moderator, I just want to, in, in addition to mentioning who, who the commission members we have here, we also have with us all the ex officio members representing both the mayor's office and the city council. Um, and since I didn't introduce myself properly, I'll just say that I'm Mark Shaw, the chair of the commission, and um, I'm a senior advisor at the uh, CUNY Institute for State and Local Governance and have been a Queens resident for, I believe, 33 years now. Um, so I'm happy to oversee the Queens committee, co Commission meeting. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to Emery, our moderator, for the hearing and take your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Shaw. My name is Emra Adev, and I work at the New York City Council's Finance Division. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been muted, you will need to, I'm sorry, if you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted by the host again. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will be calling on panels to testify one by one, so please listen for your name to be called. Commission members, you have the ability to unmute yourself during the hearing at any time. So if you have a question for a panelist, you may unmute yourself at the appropriate time, but please remember to go back on mute once you have completed your question. We will now start with testimony from elected officials, followed by the general public. Panelists, when you, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. You will then have two minutes to present your testimony. 
We will start with Councilmember Barry, uh, Barry Gordenchuk, followed by Councilmember Danique Miller. Starting time. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not in Staten Island either, but uh, one of my favorite places to see. Uh, I want to thank uh, you all for being here tonight. And I want to thank uh, the commission uh, for their work. It's so important, uh, especially uh, for a community like mine. I want to thank uh, advocates um, like Bob Friedrich and Warren Schreiber, who have been leading this fight, and Marion Rothman. I want to thank the council staff uh, headed by uh, Finance Director Latanya McKinney, uh, Ray Majewski, and Emre Adev um, as well. And I'm going to skim through my um, my testimony, but I, I do agree with much of what my constituent and neighbor Mark Shore uh, had to say. Um, and, I, and I think um, you know that the most important thing that we need to do is to produce an equitable property tax system, which simply does not exist. I know you've heard this, uh, I have to say it again, um, and I'm going to lead off um, with the, you know, I'm going to skim through it. I, I've consistently highlighted the inequities faced by owners of co-op and condo apartments uh, far from the luxury developments of Manhattan and other parts of New York City units in Eastern Queens, my community, often start around $200,000 a year offering affordable housing for teachers, police officers, and others, uh, working class and middle class New Yorkers. In addition, consider retirees whose decision to reside in co-ops and condos in New York City means that their pensions and social securities are contributing to a local economy rather than to those places with more hospitable climates, uh, especially in the winter. Um, while these affordable co-ops and condos can be brought at reasonable cost, they are burdened with property taxes that can be higher than those on million dollar homes. Um, it's not unusual to find co-op and condo owners who are paying five or $6,000 a year uh, for an apartment that would sell for two or $300,000. Um, I get that much of what we need to do or all of what we need to do. Uh, I'm expired. Well, you're quick. I'm gonna keep going though, because I know you won't shut me up. Um, I appreciate that much of what has to happen, it has to happen at the state level. Um, but when we talk about equality and we talk about equity in New York City, uh, the one thing that is perhaps the most inequitable in terms of what new, everyday New Yorkers have to deal with, those struggling to maintain a household have to deal with, is the property tax system. And uh, I know that you've worked very, very diligently to ensure that we get equity and we get fairness. Um, and I know that this is going to have to go to Albany uh, after um, this year, um, but I will be on be on the sidelines then as a private citizen. But I will be uh, helping to lead the cheer for uh, for a property tax system that creates basic fairness in the city of New York. Uh, my written testimony has been submitted. I want to again thank you all for the work that you have done. I know that this has been a most unusual uh, time for us, and that uh, much of what we wanted to do was interrupted by the pandemic. I thank the commissioners, each and every one of them. I know this is not easy work, but I know that you, uh, based upon the recommendations that you have made, you are taking it uh, quite seriously. And with that, Mr. Sergeant at Arms, I will uh, relinquish the balance of my time. Uh, Barry? Yes, Mr. Capelli. Uh, first of all, I'm a huge fan. Thank you. Uh, and I thank you for your public service. Thank you. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, we had wanted to get this done earlier, but because of the pandemic, it's later in the season that we want it. So we need your help and your fellow legislators and uh, advocates to push for reform later in the year, perhaps in the general election so that we can get this accomplished. I will, I'm available to you uh, for whatever you may need. Um, this is something that I have been working on uh, with the council staff, with um, my constituent, Bob Friedrich and Warren and, and others, Marianne Rothman, um, to create equality. Uh, we have not been able to do that. And um, it's, you know, I often say that the least sexy thing that government does is the sewer system. You ever been to a groundbreaking or ribbon cutting for a new sewer? No, the answer is never. Um, but if we didn't have sewers or they broke down, New York City would be uninhabitable about a day or two. Uh, property taxes are not sexy, 
But when you get that bill and when Bob Friedrich or Warren has to tell their shareholders, sorry, I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. And then uh, it gets even worse because sometimes, you know, my staff and I have had to do workouts uh, for a half a million dollars or more um, because there was a glitch in the computer system. And I, I see uh, Commissioner Sharif Solomon is here um, and I want to thank him, um, Department of Finance Ch uh, Commissioner. Uh, his staff has been most wonderful in that respect, but it's time. We can handle the glitches. What we can handle is a system that is oppressive and does not treat people fairly. And uh, frankly, um, in a city where most of my colleagues are talking about equity, um, the taxes on people of color are really wildly outlandish for the most part. So we need to change that. And again, I thank you. Uh, I'm available if you have any other questions. Okay, I thank you all. And I'm gonna listen to the testimony for a little while. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Grudenchik. We will now hear from Council Member Danique Miller, followed by Warren Schreiber. Starting time. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for the, to the commission for, for taking your time and, and, and gracing the great borough of Queens. Um, and let me just say about this commission, it, it, is, it, is, it is long overdue. Uh, we've had a lot of dialogue in, in, in the council uh, about tax reform, and, and we are very uh, hopeful that uh, in our demand for action, that we get a commission that we don't get the tr traditional, uh, we'll set up a commission to study. But not because we have some of my absolute favorite folks in there, starting with Commissioner Solomon and, and, and Mark and, and Professor Parrott and, and, and so many others. Um, I'm, I'm confident that we can get to where we need to be. I understand that the mandate uh, uh, for fairness uh, is, is a big part of this, but you know, um, for me, being a part of a council, and and and, and for for most of us living in the city here, where where where, where 73, 74 percent of the folks are, are renters, it's very difficult to have this conversation amongst my fifty colleagues, uh, Barry, few colleagues in Staten Island, about six of us that make up the homeowner caucus. Um, uh, it, it is very difficult. I see Ray smiling over there because I'm always picking the, the brains of Ray Majeski and, and, and Latanya McKenzie as to how we, we really do something substantive that brings relief to homeowners, uh, particularly here in Southeast Queens. We are, have been the epicenter, epicenter of uh, the foreclosure crises since 2008, that there's been very little to, to, to mitigate that, uh, you know, the, the programming that, that we fight for every year um, does not really address that. Then on top of that, you know, we, we've had the battle over the tax lien sales uh, each year. And so um, certainly this is very important to us as we uh, look over your recommendations and, and the report and, and the documents there. While we certainly I'm inspired. While we certainly agree with that, um, what's paramount to us is equity that folks are paying their fair share, that you have communities such as Southeast Queens, um, uh, in comparison to other uh, more economically affluent communities that are not necessarily paying uh, their fair share or as much because of the current formula of, of, of property assessment and, and, and property tax formula. So we want to make sure that that is addressed so that people feel that, that they are um, getting the bang for their buck and, and, and uh, the municipal resources um, that they des and, and, and services that they deserve, um, but that we, we certainly want to look at a system that everyone is, is paying their fair taxes. Certainly um, what we were able to do in, in, in the council uh, to, to address the most vulnerable, uh, the seniors over the past few years, uh, subsidies, as well as the veterans. Um, but, you know, there are so many homeowners that are really struggling um, that we, within the current system, that we have to do all that we can do. So I do have a, a statement that has been submitted that with some suggestions that I think go beyond um, what the, the 10 suggestions that, that, that we're focusing on um, this evening. Uh, and, and as Barry said, that will certainly, the, the, the homeowners caucus will certainly make itself available to make sure 
that whatever can be done to address this and uh, make a more favorable, equitable, and more importantly, transparent system. I know the work that you've done over how uh, the, the bills come out um, and, and, and how it's broken down, as well as the, the, the forums uh, to, to give explanations to the constituency of, of how these bills uh, occur is, is important. Um, but I think that we can still do a little more to simplify it and, and to make it a little more transparent. So with that, uh, I just want to thank everyone. And I want to thank uh, the folks from the community that have signed on as well to, to really be a part of it, because this is where the advocacy comes from. I, I, although I do see um, that there are some, some industry folks that have weighed in by virtue of uh, uh, the, uh, I think it's four to 10, on the cooperative and 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 others uh, have have not necessarily been addressed and 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 so we want to balance the scale and have as many uh, ordinary homeowners weighing in and having having their voices heard as possible. So so thank you. Look forward to working with you, and I hope that you guys really take a look at our suggestions and uh, our testimony. So have a good night. Thank you all. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Um, we will now hear from Warren Schreiber, followed by Robert Friedrich. Starting time. Okay, uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes okay, we can hear you. Th thank you. Okay, so here goes uh, two minutes. Uh, my name is uh, Warren Schreiber. I'm the president of Bay Terrace Cooperative Section 1. I am also co-president of the President's Co-op and Condo Council. I want to thank the Commission for their work on property tax reform, but as is often said, the devil is in the details. Unfortunately, the Commission recommendations provide little in absolute numbers and raise more questions than the answer. How will the cooperative fair market value be determined? For example, is the fair market value based on unit sales from the same cooperative property or will sales from neighboring cooperatives also be part of the assessed valuation? Does the commission propose ending the 6% annual and five year 20% protective cap for all residential properties, including cooperatives? What are the income thresholds for the proposed cooperative circuit breaker and partial homestead exemption? The commission recommends a gradual transition to the new system for current owners with an immediate change into the new system whenever a property in the new residential class is sold. Cooperative units are transferred, not sold. Therefore, a, unit, a unit, single unit transfer should not trigger an immediate transition to the new system. We can't determine the impact of the commission's proposed recommendations on housing, in the cooperative form without additional information that includes actual numbers. Currently, we are not able to take a position on the proposed property tax changes. However, there is agreement that the current system unfairly burdens middle income shareholders residing in affordable cooperative housing. I look forward to future proposals from the Property Tax Commission that treats cooperative properties equitably. The New York City Department of Finance must do everything possible to protect, and, to protect and preserve affordable cooperative housing. And I almost made the two minutes. Thank you, Emre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Warren. Um, we will now hear from Robert Friedrich, followed by Councilmember Selvana Brooks Powers, who is able to join us now. Starting time. We may have lost uh, Robert Friedrich. Um, he's back now. One second. Mr. Mr. Friedrich, you're you're uh, you're okay to go now. Okay, my I was just uh, shut down in my end, but I'm back on. Okay, my name is Bob Friedrich, and I'm president of Glen Oaks Village, the largest garden of pop and co-op in New York with 10,000 residents. I'm also the founder and co-president of the President's Co-op and Condo Council, a think tank of 100 board presidents representing more than 40,000 units of co-op and condo affordable housing. The greatest threat to the fundamental affordability of our co-op and condo communities lies with the city's failed 
property tax and valuation system, which values co-ops and condos as if they are fictional rental properties that generate profits. They are neither. The system wreaks havoc on our budgeting process by not providing the needed predictability of costs. The commission must recognize that most city co-ops are not the multi-million dollar co-ops found in Manhattan, but are more like the affordable $275,000 ones found in Glen Oaks Village. The commission's proposal to value all co-op condos at fair market value to fix the undervaluation of high-end properties that pay low property taxes relative to their fair market value will impact middle-class affordable co-op and condo owners by increasing their property taxes above current levels. The commission's report acknowledged that without adjustments, there would be significant increases on affordable co-ops that make up most of the co-op housing stock in the city. In order to mitigate the anticipated property tax increases, the commission recommends two assessed valuation adjustments, homestead exemption and the circuit breaker. For middle class and affordable co-op and condo owners, this is the most important component of your report and will have the greatest impact. The income level set for recipients of the homestead exemption and circuit breaker will determine winners and losers of this proposal. If the income threshold for the homestead exemption is set incorrectly and does not capture middle class co-op and condo owners, then these owners will be among the big losers of the property tax reform proposal. And just one last note, as a final note, we ask the tax commission to be mindful that assessed valuation increases will have a profound effect on J51 exemption eligibility. As you know, J51 is based on the average assessed valuation of $33,000 per unit. Since the assessed valuation will increase significantly as we move to a fair market valuation system, all affordable co-ops will lose their J51 eligibility unless you address this issue head on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert Friedrich. Um, we will now hear from Council Member Brooks Powers, followed by Marianne Rothman. Time starts now. Thank you and good evening. First, I'd like to thank the New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform. This conversation this evening is super critical because as we all know, home ownership remains the key to achieving the American dream. It is how many families have built intergenerational wealth and the glaring disparity with the property tax formula has made it harder to accomplish. As the city begins to reopen from the pandemic and our economy strives to rebound, many New Yorkers are still reeling from from having endured compounding crises over the last several decades. The cost of living has grown while wages have remained flat. I believe this report is well-intentioned and its recommendations target some serious flaws in the current system, allowing for communities such as the ones I represent to pay higher taxes while the value of their properties remain the same. We must shape a fairer system, one that is easier to understand, but when it comes to changing our property tax system, we need to be deliberate. Even the best of intentions can have unintended consequences. So I also want to ensure to be sure that these recommendations don't inadvertently put an undue financial burden on property owners. I would also implore the commission to further explore how we can offset what I have found to be a substantial burden on our seniors. Our older New Yorkers have spent much of their lives working hard to achieve home ownership only to find in the later years the inability to pay their taxes on a fixed income. There needs to be true fairness with tax assessments, all while we create a relief valve for seniors and families under certain income levels from being adversely impacted. As I've said before, I encourage, I'm encouraged by the initial work of this commission, and I hope that this preliminary report is just the beginning of your engagement with community stakeholders. We need to make sure that New Yorkers understand the full scope of these proposed changes, and I look forward to working with the, con the commission to continue their outreach. And thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brooks Powers. Uh, we will now hear from Marianne Rothman, followed by Gina Barros. Time starts now. Good evening. 
My name is Mary Ann Rothman. I'm the executive director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, representing hundreds of the housing cooperatives and condominiums in all five boroughs of New York City and beyond. Since 1990, when we founded the Action Committee for Reasonable Real Estate Taxes, CNYC has been advocating for fair, equitable, and easily understood property taxes for all of New York City. Uh, and I've been attending all the hearings that you guys are, are, are putting forth. Uh, commenting each time on a different one of your of the recommendations in the preliminary report. Today I would like to comment on recommendation number four, which calls for two things, the elimination of assessed value caps and that the changes in market value be phased in over five years at the rate of 20% per year. CNYC agrees that assessed value caps have contributed to the inequities in our current system as they have made it impossible to capture increases in areas where market values have climbed rapidly while at the same time leading to unfairly high tax in areas where the market advances more slowly. Assessed value caps should indeed be eliminated from the new system. But because there are likely to be major changes in taxes for some New Yorkers as the new system is implemented, we would like to propose that the, change be the changes be phased in over 10 years rather than five. We further suggest that this phase in should continue to apply even as residences are sold or transferred. Any other treatment seems to us difficult to impossible to implement in housing cooperatives where the property tax bill is levied on the cooperative as a whole and paid on a per share basis by all shareholders as part of their monthly maintenance charges. Time. And fairness would dictate that the same procedure be used for all other members of the residential class as well. Thank you for this opportunity to express our views. Thank you, Marianne Rothman. We'll now from Gina Barros, followed by Matthew Joseph. Time starts now. I'm here. Okay. Good evening. We can hear you now. You can go oh, ahead. Very good. good evening. <clears throat> I am the homeowner of a two family house in South side of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where I have lived over 25 years and I have lived in Brooklyn my entire life. I now live on a retirement income, yet I continue to pay increasing property taxes. At this point, 10,000 because my house the market value of my house has been increasing, which is now at 1,800. I do not intend to sell my house. I intend to continue living here, which is my home. Furthermore, I intend to continue to provide my tenant with affordable housing because this has been my tenant for 20 years. And I believe in affordable housing. I support therefore in creating partial homestead exemption for primary resident owners with income below a certain threshold and creating a circuit breaker with the property tax system to lower the property tax burden on low income primary resident owners as based on the ratio of property tax paid to income. I also recommend a tax abatement for those homeowners that provide their tenants with affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Gina Barros. Uh, we will now hear from Matthew Joseph, followed by Alexis Foote. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Matthew Joseph. I live in Belrose, Queens. I'm a city assessor at the Department of Finance and um, vice president of the Sussex Local 1757. Uh, Commissioner Suleiman, please make a note that I'm testifying on my own 
It has nothing to do with the finance department or the union, okay? I'm, I'm testifying as a citizen of Belrose. Um, I have testified before. I'm glad that the committee took note of uh, partial note of one of my suggestions, which is full market value assessment. But I want to emphasize, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to read the whole testimony. I have sent in my comments on the um, recommendations of the committee also, the 10 recommendations. But um, I just want to emphasize two points. One is full market value. I suggest that all properties should be assessed at full market value. And also I suggest that we create a special tax class for one family homes only. Residential one family homes owner occupied. Okay, make note, owner occupied only. Because as far as I'm concerned, two families and three families are income producing properties. So they should not be grouped with one family uh, homes. So I thank you. Um, that's all. Thank you, Matthew Joseph. Um, you. We will now hear from Alexis Foote, followed by Joanna Rock. Time starts now. Hi. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I think, no, I know. Tax property reform needs to keep homeowners and future homeowners like myself and mine, my husband and I are essential workers. And right now we rent and pay almost $2,000, but we can't afford a home in New York because of not only gentrification, because of the property tax. But when you're also reforming the property tax, you also need to talk about uh, property tax liens because a lot of the homes in Far Rockaway are under these property tax liens and Mellon Bank has these homes and the sales of the homes support Delaware and their property taxes. So that definitely needs to be looked at. I did the research and there are over a hundred homes in Far Rockaway that are under this, this particular tax lease sale that Mellon Bank does that supports Delaware's taxes. Once again, me and my husband, husband would love to be homeowners, but because of the property taxes and all of the gentrification that's going on, my husband and I cannot own a home. And that's another thing. You have to look at the property taxes for the developers. They're getting too many breaks and all they're doing is building luxury homes. Thank you for listening and I appreciate it. Thank you, Alexis Foot. We will now hear from Joanna Rock, followed by Frank Taylor. Time starts now. Good evening, everyone. I am the president of the board of directors at City Lights, a Long Island City co-op since 2015. For over five years, we've been struggling to find a way to help our middle income communities stay in their homes. We've reviewed your recommendations and it is unclear how they will impact us. City Lights desperately needs your help in addressing a serious problem that threatens the viability of our affordable building and has already caused many of our longtime residents and owners to have to leave their homes due to financial burdens fixed income and middle income folks cannot tolerate. City Light sits on the New York state land in Queens. Former governor Mario Cuomo envisioned our anchor building as the first step in a master plan to transform a contaminated and derelict area in Queens into a vibrant waterfront community. When residents started to move into City Lights in 1997, there was nothing around us but dilapidated warehouses, wild dogs, and very few services. We were truly pioneers. The building was marketed as middle income housing and the first four floors of apartments had low income requirements. As part of the original structure to reduce the developer's risk and keep purchase prices low to attract buyers, we were saddled with a huge $87 million mortgage. From day one, our residents have paid unusually high monthly maintenance charges. Now, as our pilot taxes are phased in, we are faced with dramatic increases in our notice of property value. A year before the abatement ended, New York City Department of Finance doubled our assessed value. To give you an idea of the impact, the city and state are asking us to pay over 55% of the co-op's revenue and pilot taxes. 
Our assessment is higher than most New York City co-ops. This is not tenable. We are unusual for a co-op in that we are surrounded by newer, more luxurious rental buildings owned by national corporations. Our property tax is much higher than it should be because all of the comparables are these types of buildings. In fact, it is now cheaper for a new prospective buyer to rent in one of those buildings than it is to own in City Lights. Time. More than 25% of our shareholders are retired and many are on fixed incomes. Almost half of the building is over 50 years of age and headed towards retirement in the not too distant future. We have several civil servants. We have a strong and vibrant community that looks out for each other. We have great relationships with our electeds and we cannot get a solution. The fate of more than a thousand middle income residents rests in the city's hands. We urge you to protect the affordable housing that we were promised. If you don't, the middle class pioneers who built one of New York City's greatest neighborhoods will surely lose their homes. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna Rock. Uh, we will now hear from Frank Taylor, followed by Phil Konigsberg. Time starts now. Hello? I can hear you. Again. Okay, great. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everyone. I, I didn't expect to get a chance to speak, but I appreciate you allowing that. Uh, my name is Frank Taylor. I am a retired law enforcement officer from the city of New York. I am a World Trade uh, first responder. I am the president of Dit Barnes Boulevard Block Association. And I'm also a member of the community board, which I saw uh, Mr. Schreiber here earlier. He's of seven, I'm of community board three. I'm not representing my community board though. I am representing my area. East Elmhurst is a great area. It was called North Beach at one time. Uh, it's off the water and it's a beautiful place to live. Until recently, we have been overtaxed over here for the past, for decades. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, uh, Councilman Drum, uh, uh, also Mayor de Blasio, he also came and he, and they both said that this is right, that there was a commission being started by the city council, which we never got an answer to. Uh, my neighborhood, uh, East Elmhurst, uh, basically uh, Jackson Heights and Corona, you have a lot of senior citizens over in East Elmhurst uh, who have served their country, either veterans or, or, or however they've served. Uh, it's a legacy housing where a lot of housing has been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, this is a situation that is untenable because over here we pay such high taxes and we can't even get our garbage picked up one time. There's schools being built around here that are not servicing people from East Elmhurst because you have a bus system. So you know that kids are being bused in, which is, which is great. But why are we paying for this? Uh, we need to pay for things that are needed in the community. We don't even have a hospital in this area. These are things that we need to fund. Our promenade, uh, there's a project from Port Authority that's trying to be shoved down our throat to fix the promenade to which we pay a lot of taxes to and nothing gets done. I'd like to agree with one gentleman that said that there should be a separate Time. Uh, status. There should be a separate status for one family houses that are single family houses, especially the retired uh, uh, individuals. Uh, I, as I say again, and I, don't, I hate repeating myself, but I do appreciate you guys taking this up. I do appreciate the, the, the job that you guys are doing, but we need action now. We need action now. We are supporting the airport. We support Rikers Island and a whole bunch of other stuff over here, but nobody is supporting us. So I appreciate the council. I appreciate this commission. And thank you very much for giving me this time to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Frank Taylor. Uh, we will now hear from Phil, Phil Conisberg, followed by John Presida. Time starts now. It appears that uh, Phil Conisberg has, is no longer in the Zoom right now. Um, so we will uh, next, go to uh, John Presida, followed Time. by Robin Harper. Time starts now.
Mr. Prasad, you may, may start when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, thank you for having me. Hearing me. Uh, Mayor de Blasio declared that a real estate assessment is unfair causing property owners to pay too much real estate taxes. Well, that's just not true. The current state law, S7000A slash A9200, controlling real estate assessments is a good law. It provides for protection against unfair increases in your current assessment while allowing for corrections to unfair assessments. The law is a result of the court decision made in 1975, of course, the Hellestein decision, it required the state to come up with a better way to assess properties. The simplest correction would be to reassess all properties at 100% of value. Simple, but disastrous. The Speaker of the House of the State Assembly at that time, Stanley Fink, thought that reassessing at 100% of value was a good idea and started to move to pass it into law. But 1,400 civic associations across the state opposed it. A five-year battle ended in an agreement between the state Democrats, the state Republicans, and the coalition of civic associations, and it, which agreed with, and the bank with, and the court that agreed with, all agreeing to the current state law as 7,900. I was one of five civic leaders who met in the speaker's office and hammered out the agreed bill. Now real estate taxes in New York are getting unbearable, but not because of unfair assessments, but because of the mayor's out of control budget. Our state law does not protect New York City homeowners from an increase in tax rate because it is totally controlled by the mayor and the city council. Maybe we need a state law limiting the tax rate on homes, co-ops and condominiums. What is really going on now is the mayor is trying to put the blame on the high real estate taxes on the state assessment law and away from his incompetence. Don't let him touch our law. Without the protections in A7, uh, S7000 9200, many homeowners will see huge increases in their real estate tax bills. These increases will be higher than they can afford and high enough to force them to sell their homes. And when they do sell their homes, because of the high tax burden, they won't get the price that they could thought they could get. Time. The only correction I, I would agree to in our law is taking the co-ops and condominiums out of the commercial section and to create another section for co-ops and condominiums. The new section must have the same protections enjoyed by the one, two, and three family homes. Thank you. Thank you, John Presida. We will now hear from Robin Harper followed by council member uh, Robert Holden. Time starts now. Good evening. Um, my name is Robin Harper and I want to thank you for this opportunity. My family and I own a, a home in Queens where we've lived for the last 20 years. When we bought our house, our taxes were of a reasonable amount. We expected a normal increase year on year of taxes and we budgeted for that anticipated increase. We did not expect that our taxes would increase by 500% over the last 20 years. The market value increase for our home is less than double than what we paid. Let me repeat what I said before. Our property taxes are five times as much as they were when we bought our home 20 years ago. That's not a normal increase. I understand under this proposal that our taxes may double. There is already far, fair market value through the property tax algorithm. Do not lift the cap or people will lose their homes. I implore you to look at developing neighborhoods around the city, in Jamaica, in Flushing, where they are growing and developing because of immigrants and minorities who invested in homes and businesses and longtime residents and the elderly who stayed put, who contributed to their communities and created a stable environment. We planted roots in our communities that others abandoned. We bought our homes expecting a reasonable tax bill. This proposal has the propensity to destroy neighborhoods by massively increasing taxes and forcing immigrants, minorities, longtime residents and the elderly from their homes, creating more homelessness and unstable communities. No one planned for these kind of tax increases that you are proposing. These increases will price people out of their homes. Yes, we're, it's abundantly clear that the city needs money, but the only people to benefit from this proposal are the developers who are licking their chops at the prospect of the houses that are soon to be lost by immigrants, minorities, elderly, and people like me who didn't flee the city when services declined and the quality of life was in question. We stayed put, we invested, we raised our children here, and we contributed to our communities. 
time. You punish us for believing in New York City. Find another way to raise capital. Property taxes are regressive measures that hurt those most likely to invest and stabilize the city. This proposal will hurt the very communities the city keeps insisting it needs. Thank you very much. Ms. Hoffer? Ms. Hoffer, uh, could you send us your uh, current tax and the uh, per, uh, perspective increases so we can look at that? Sure. Sure thing. It's it's a matter of public record. Thank you. Do I? How do I? To whom do I send it? Uh, Ms. Harper, if you uh, submit testimony on the Property Tax Commission's website, the Reform Commission, you can include um, a document that outlines uh, more specifically your property and the tax increase that you are worried I, about. I can send you twenty years worth of data showing exactly year to year increases. It's shameful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now hear from Councilmember Robert Holden, uh, followed by Nancy Silverman. Time starts now. Thank you for giving me the time to speak today, and thank you all for your work on this. Uh, as council member with many homeowners in his district, this issue is of uh, personal importance. Uh, to build an inclusive economy, you must have a middle class. Ownership is key to economic mobility and financial stability. During my time in the council, I co-sponsored two bills to alleviate property tax bur burdens. The first, Local Law 42, increased the threshold for when a property owner was required to provide a certified statement of income to receive an assessment reduction by the tax commission. This eliminated uh, needless paperwork and regulations for owners whose property was valued at less than 5 million. Additionally, I sponsored Local Law 45, which is legislation that allows property owners with tax arrears to enter into an installment agreement to offer to pay off the debt over a period of 10 years with zero dollars down. Getting those bills passed was not easy and efforts to lower property taxes, tax rates often come up short. So I thank the commission for tackling this difficult issue. While the commission's report is only preliminary, I am concerned about eliminating all assessed value growth caps for new home buyers and the immediate transition into the new tax system whenever a residential property is sold. While I understand the commission's goals of having tax assessments better reflect real property values, eliminating all growth caps could drive down the value of the homes for current owners. If a current homeowner is paying $7,000 in taxes every year, but the new homeowner will pay 15,000, the value of that home will undoubtedly decrease to the detriment of the current homeowner. Additionally, homeowners who purchase property on a 30 year plan need to forecast their expenses. Older adults who are on a fixed income need to be especially protected from tax increases that would force them to sell their homes. Finally, uh -huh. I would remind everyone listening that the commission and the commission that the mayor and the city council have within their power to lower property tax rates. Unfortunately, Mayor de Blasio focused on needless spending such as the failed Thrive NYC instead of lowering taxes for hardworking New Yorkers. The next mayor and city council needs to lower property tax rates for our middle-class homeowners. New York should not be a place where you're either struggling or rich. We need to attract a strong, vibrant middle-class that can afford single-family homes. I urge the commission to keep the middle-class at the forefront of their minds uh, as they work on their final report. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Uh, we will now hear from Nancy Silverman, followed by Lynette Townsley. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, my testimony is a little bit off topic, but it is also about equity. Thank you. Staff Congress, the union representing the 30,000 faculty and staff at, sorry, I, I think my, I'm gonna turn my camera off because my internet is breaking up. 
I'm here as a member of the Professional Staff Congress, the union representing the 30,000 faculty and staff at the City University of New York, CUNY, as a professional staff member at the Graduate Center of CUNY and as a resident of Queens. We want to call to your attention, call your attention to a significant source of untapped revenue from the property tax exemptions given to private universities in New York City, specifically NY, New York University, their real estate investment. $174 million, according to the Department of Finance formula. These figures are low as they are from a testimony given in 2018, but provide an important starting point that is that this is a significant source of untapped revenue. We are proposing a rethinking of those tax exemptions as, a, as one way to invest in and provide needed resources for New York City's public university, CUNY. The provision in, this, in the state constitution for property tax exempts for private university could not have been envisioned that NYU and Columbia would have accumulated such vast and valuable real estate holdings in addition to their multi-billion dollar endowments. This is not an attack on NYU and Columbia. We value our colleagues in the intellectual community that has been generated by NYU and Columbia, which has provided a significant resource for New York City. While NYU and Columbia pay no property taxes and their students get the benefit of small classes, full-time professors, readily available counselors, abundantly equipped libraries, laboratories, and student centers, uni students have to make do with crowded classrooms, leaky few, CUNY undergraduates at the community college, which receive funding from the city, are 85% people of color and have average family incomes below 35%. Time. Excuse me, Ms. Silverman, I wanted to assure you that even though your internet cut in and out, um, your testimony, I read your testimony today, so it's on record and also so are, so is on record uh, testimony by similar colleagues of yours who testified in uh, both Staten Island and Brooklyn, okay? I, I appreciate that and, and I had two more sentences and since every other person went over their two minutes, I'd appreciate if I could finish those two sentences. I'm sorry, I thought you were done because I couldn't hear anything. Oh, my apologies, my internet, right. and I will- then I I'll, know it's it's been going in and out. I wanted okay, you to then, know it was going in and out. Okay, then I will move on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Uh, we will now hear from Lynette Townsley, followed by Victor Starsky. Starting time. Good afternoon. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having this commission. Um, as we know, all of us would like a quality of life for all in this great city of New York City. Um, I'm a resident of Addisley Park in Southeast Queens. I'm a Community Board 12 member, um, and I am speaking on behalf of myself. Um, we know that our community has really bit, been hit hard by COVID and we are still going through a lot of trauma of death in our community. And even before this, we had such a rise in foreclosures and we don't know what it's gonna look like once all of these forbearances are lifted. And I just would like to really urge everyone, you know, um, I was blessed to be able to purchase my home from my parents and be a homeowner. And at the age of 50, I'm looking to retire, but I'm a little concerned at what I'm hearing and what I've read that I may not be able to retire or my children um, because of this additional burden. As you know, here in Southeast Queens, um, there's a lot of development going on. And although a lot of the development says affordable housing, um, a lot of these developments have housings that the apartments is like a mortgage. 
So it's bringing up, although it's bringing up the high value, you know, I do not want to have to refinance my home just to live. And I want to be able to retire. So I do ask, I understand that this is very important, uh, but as you can see, a lot of people from our community is not on here because we are dealing with so many things at time one time. time. Um, so please, please, thank you for having this, but please come back to our community, especially, especially Southeast Queens, where there are a lot of single family homes and allow us to have this discussion together so that we all can live in a city that is, has quality and safety. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lynette Townsley. We will now hear from Victor Starsky and uh, next up on deck after that, please forgive any mispronunciation of this name, but Oluwafami Okiowo. Starting time. Good evening, my name is Victor Starsky. I'm a 60 year resident of uh, Richmond Hill, Queens. I'm also a proud homeowner of a uh, Queensmark house in North Richmond Hill, which was just designated a historical district. Um, most of the homeowners on our block, we're a small block of 14 homes. Most of us have retired senior citizens, handicapped, disabled, on fixed income. Charging, uh, changing the tax structure by imposing a 20% per year increase on the market value of residential homes is criminal. This would force people out of their homes. Uh, to lump everyone into a property tax reform to uh, remediate this inequity would punish those who have been paying their fair share all along. Um, some residents, uh, such as Park Slope, Williamsburg, some areas of Williamsburg, Bedford Stuyvesant, uh, have been uh, have had a cap of six percent. Meanwhile, their property value has gone sky high, and there's a great inequity there. With that alone, uh, we're already burdened with existing property tax and the upkeep and other expenses of this historic homes. And this proposed increase would make it unaffordable for us to live here. Creating a so-called circuit break system, the lower tax bracket for low-income property residents, which is based on a ratio of property tax on low income, is unfair to people all around. We struggle to make ends meet. This, this is for everybody. I speak for everybody. We all bear a burden of taxes. We already pay high taxes. Homeowners insured, sewer and gas bills and utilities bills, which have gone up exponentially over the last I'm few expired. years. The term current class sharing system is ridiculous. To say that the system is predictable for a class system is incomprehensible in these times. People are struggling. Just send us a life preserver because we will not be able to live here in this city the mayor should really look at where his spending is, and I appreciate you giving me the time to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vic Krasarski. We will now hear from Oluwafami Okiowo, followed by William Gatti. Starting time. Although if I may, if you are there, uh, please unmute yourself. You can testify at this moment. Or maybe uh, although if I may stepped away. So in that case, we'll go to William, William Gatti and then followed by Arthur Taylor. Tail, uh, sorry, Taylor. Starting time. Apparently, William Gotti has also uh, stepped away. So we'll go to Arthur Taylor, followed by Mark Anaya. Starting time.
Arthur, you're gonna to need to press the unmute button. Should see a notification asking you to unmute. There you go. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, all right, my name is Arthur Tyler and my internet is also going in and out and uh, <laughs> you call me just as back in. Uh, and uh, 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 we appreciate the commission uh, commitment to the basics and a uh, fair and equitable uh, system. And I'm, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Queens Community Board number three. We hear complaints and comments from our neighbors on all kinds of issues, including property tax issues. I wanna talk about two issues. Uh, one is the property tax on single family houses and two family houses. And uh, uh, the second issue is the property tax on co-ops. And uh, uh, a, a, uh, some of what I had to say has already been said, and I'm gonna do my best not to duplicate uh, because uh, uh, time is short. Uh, first, the, the homeowners in our, uh, uh, have been complaining that East Elmhurst has paid an out of proportion tax uh, for, for others. And uh, we, we hear the same into a, uh, you know, from co-ops. And what I just want to point out is that basic economics is that anything sold retail is going to be less, is going to be more expensive than anything sold in bulk. So individual homeowners uh, and uh, individual co-opers cannot be compared to garden, complex, garden apartment complexes or housing complexes or to uh, apartment builders or, or developers that, uh, uh, you know, there has to be some give and take uh, and, uh, and that the backbone of our community is, is not the majority of the people who, who live in uh, uh, rental apartments, but the people that live in single family houses and co-ops. They're the people that stay I'm expired. from year to year. And all right, I thank you for hearing uh, you know, as much as I could get in. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, we'll now hear from Mark Anaya, followed by William Gatti. Starting time. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Uh, my camera's not working either, so that's why I'm not putting myself up there. Uh, my name is Mark Anaya. I'm a lifelong resident in uh, the Rockaway Beaches. And I just got some suggestions and they're just really simple stuff. Um, for single family houses, class one, I know that also goes class one is single family and two family. But my suggestion is, is just make it easy and make it fair, the property tax. It's so confusing with the assessment and your time to buy this and all that stuff. My suggestion is for single family houses, just tax the property. If the property is a 30 by a hundred, make them pay $3,000. If the property is a hundred by a hundred, they pay ten thousand dollars. If it's if it's a hundred, you know, if it's fifty by a hundred, they pay five thousand dollars. Just something simple like that that people understand, and make it fair for everybody. Because if you have a house and then you put some new siding on it or some new windows and doing this, your property tax keeps going up, and all you're doing is holding people back to improving their house. They should be rewarded when they when they fix up their house or their or their landscaping or do a new driveway because they're stimulating the economy. They're making the house uh, more efficient, more green, and it looks better for the neighborhood. But what we're doing is we're penalizing them people. We're, we're, we're adding more property tax. It ain't house. This is house tax, actually. So my suggestion is tax the property for single family houses. Make it simple. You own a 20 by 100, $2,000. Um, my other suggestion is Maybe a rebate you give for all this pandemic going on for the first responders and essential workers. I know you got stuff for veterans and I know you got other things for senior citizens, but maybe maybe you can give a rebate or a tax abatement, not a tax payment, but a rebate for first responders, essential workers, people that work through this whole thing and keep the city going. Um, but that's my suggestion to make it simple. I've been paying the house of tax. And it's really difficult to understand what you're paying with all these times in and assessing and all that. But thank you for listening to me. And please 
take my suggestion for single family house. It make it make it simple. Right, thanks, thanks for listening. Mark, I uh, just want to say thank you for your testimony, and I agree with most of what you said. Thank you. No, thank you. And I uh, maybe maybe this will happen just for single family houses. You know, I know big corporate buildings and this that. That's something different. But like you said, senior citizens. They're on a fixed income. It's a single family house. These people can't pay these $10,000, $20,000, $15,000 property taxes. You're running them out of their uh, houses. It's a shame. But thanks again, and uh, be well, everybody. Thank you, Mark. We will now hear from William Gotti, followed by Walter Weiss. Starting time. So thank you for this great opportunity. I want to thank the commission for your valuable um, input and valuable time. Um, I represent the Richmond Hill Historical Society and in um, you know, reference to historical districts, uh, we're particularly burdened by the need to restore our older homes. And a lot of us are um, already in retirement age and uh, are financially burdened as well. <clears throat> so in particular, I'd like the, uh, the commission to consider historical areas. I did submit a written testimony, so I won't repeat it uh, because it would be a waste of time. I've heard a lot of the other uh, testimonies. I concur with Robin Harper's testimony and also with uh, Commissioner Holden's testimony. Um, so I, I want to just spend a moment talking about the possibility of someone, you know, maybe a, a first time homeowner buying into a historic district and um, realizing after the purchase that their taxes have gone up and uh, the money is limited either by salary or by their economic condition. Um, they can't afford to fix up their property. It can cost uh, a considerable amount of money uh, to do that. And as a result, uh, you know, historic districts will go in disrepair. Um, worse than that, there's a good possibility that uh, the owners will be forced to subdivide their units illegally and rent it out to illegal tenants as well, create, creating a undesirable uh, environment for people to live in. Um, I think that this particular uh, tax reform is a great concept. I'm expired. But one needs to be um, mindful of different uh, communities and how it would impact them. What we're gonna to try to avoid is um, flight from Queens to other areas and even out of state as a result of uh, financial tax burdens. So I, I would implore the uh, commission to keep in mind uh, certain neighborhoods that are um, particularly hit hard by taxes because we have very large historical houses that require tremendous amount of cash in order to maintain them, to heat them, to pay utility bills and so forth and so on. So thank you very much for your uh, time and your effort. And uh, I hope uh, you put together something that will be equitable for all. Thank you, William. Uh... We will now hear from Walter Weiss, followed by Rosario Sinisi. Starting time. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Good evening. Uh, my name is Walter Weiss. I'm the president of the board at Lane Towers uh, Co-op in Forest Hills. And I want to state unequivocally that I do not want to see, I would not like to see any additional taxes on co-ops until it's equal with the residential units. Uh, I'd like to delve into this a little. Here at Lane Towers in 2017, our co-op paid $633,000 in real estate taxes. Last year in 2021, this year, our real estate taxes were $737,000. That means that our taxes increased 16.3% over four years. Now in our co-op, we have 160 units. So on average, each shareholder is paying 
$4,600 a year in taxes, 4,600. Now, how does that compare to houses on 108th street across the street? Okay. I was talking to um, one of the assistants from Ms. Kozowitz and he figured a house would cost maybe $1 million would pay a taxes of about 3,600. So to just put this into perspective, a house costing $1 million, which is almost twice as much as the value of something in our co-op is paying $3,600. That's totally unfair, totally unfair. And I think this needs to be addressed. Um, one way I think you could address it, which is I haven't seen on the topic, is I think we have vacant properties around here. We have stores, we have unused property, uh, residential units. These should be taxed double the rate. This way we get more money, the taxes go down, and we have more property available to the people. I wanna thank you, but I do not think there should be any tax increase for co-ops. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Um, we will now hear from Rosario Sinisi, followed by Miles Grant. Starting time. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. You um, thank you. I testified at the commission's May 27th hearing and I submitted 17 pages of written testimony in support of my oral testimony. Um, the commission's online text regarding hearing registration states, quote, please be advised that any personal information you provide in your commentary or testimony will be publicly available and remain part of the public record, unquote. I was contacted by an individual who listened to the May 27th hearing requesting a copy of my written testimony. I am also interested in reviewing written testimony of others. Yesterday, I called the number on the commission's website to inquire about how to get copies of written testimony submitted to the commission and was informed that to the best of their knowledge, there were, quote, no plans to release the written testimony, unquote. So I would like to know whether that testimony will be produced in response to FOIL requests. And if not, how long would go about getting access to that documentation, which the commission has stated it considers in making its recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Rosario. Um, we will now hear from Miles Grant, uh, and we will then try again with uh, Oluwafemi uh, Okio if, if Oluwafemi is available. Starting time. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can Hello. hear you. Let me begin. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, my name is Miles Grant, um, and I want to just contribute uh, my perspective on some of the blatant wealth inequality that I see in my neighborhood of Whitestone. Um, I think what's missing here and where there's an incredible chance to do something um, is explicitly higher taxes on those who own property with incredible value. Um, I think this advisory commission has a really strong opportunity here to raise much needed funds for really desperately underfunded city services. Um, you know, the, the lives and the apartments and the houses that you see here, it becomes very clear that the rich are not being taxed enough. Um, if you can afford a fancy condo with a view of the water, like many people do here in Whitestone, uh, then you deserve to be taxed to oblivion. Um, I see people living in pain and, you know, living paycheck to paycheck in the same neighborhood that you have these million dollar condos and one paycheck's worth of that money, these people can just spend in an afternoon. Um, and I think there needs to be, there's a chance here to create explicitly higher taxes on the wealthy. Um, and I think that that's absolutely important to the future of Queens. Um, I, I think that it's, and I think that that property tax is a great way to do that. Um, and I don't see that here, but I think there's a good opportunity to do that. Um, so I think that that's, that's something that I'd just like to have here as well as kind of a counterpoint to a lot of the other things that I've heard as well, although uh, strong support for that as well. I think if you are not super wealthy, um, then that tax burden should be lowered. And by increasing taxes on incredibly valuable apartments, you can actually reduce some of this tax burden. Um, so yeah, that's that that's my that's my main take there is uh, if if it's possible to create an explicit luxury property tax um, even more so than it currently exists. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Miles. Um, we will now hear from Oluwafemi Okiyowo. Starting time. Appears that Olofemi might not be available. Um, in that case, we will go to uh, Yvette. I don't have the last name, apologies for that, but Yvette, you may testify now. Starting time. Okay, hi, I had to unmute. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, one of the re reasons why I asked to speak is I'm a resident of district, well, I live in Laurelton. And when I read the report, one of my concerns in the report that it does not really discuss the disparity with regards to the tax base and rate from one community to the next, although they have, it's the same homes. So for instance, in Bayside, the same builder, same type of home is valued at X amount of dollars and they are actually paying lower taxes than in my area with the value is lower, deemed lower. And that wasn't really addressed in the report and I'm not sure exactly why, but it needs to be something that's addressed across the board because the disparity has been going on for years. I've owned my home for over, well, 30 years now and I've seen nothing but my taxes go up. And I also, it's not clear on how the assessment assessments are done. Every year I get an assessment value, but I have no idea what exactly they assess to come up with this value so that my taxes are increased every year. In addition, the appeal process is not clear either. And that's something that needs to be very clear. And not for nothing, I'd like to know the results of who appealed, who won versus who didn't win and why, because that hasn't been cleared at all. And I know I have 35 seconds left, but that's one of, that's one of, something that I wanted to speak about. And thank you. Thank you, Yvette. If there is anyone in the Zoom room right now that has not testified but would like to do so, please use the raise hand function and we will call on you. We have Robert Friedrich uh, has raised his hand, so we'll um, chair Shaw. We've we've had a few people who've already testified who'd like to testify again. Would you like to hear their testimony again, or um, I, I, I'm okay as long as they keep their comments to a, a minute or so. Thank okay. you. All right, um, all right. So we'll hear from Robert Friedrich, followed by Lynette Townsley. Starting time. Uh, Robert, hold on one second. You're not unmuted. All right. You can begin now. Okay, thank you. I just have a quick question for the chairman or for any other the commission members. We all know it's going to be very difficult to figure out how we're going to tax co-ops because it's a co-op entity that pays a tax on behalf of the shareholders. At one meeting, we once talked about the possibility of maybe looking at co-op owners the same way we do with condos. Uh, in other words, uh, taxing them totally separate apart from the co-op. Was that ever given any consideration? I know it was kind of an outlier suggestion, but that would really eliminate all the complications of co-ops. So, so, so Robert, look, we, I mean, part of the reason we're holding these public hearings now is to, is to listen to testimony like yours and, and take it up in our deliberations and you know as you know these are preliminary recommendations we plan on meeting as a commission to to talk about them to reflect on on the input we're getting from these public hearings and um you know at this point truth of the matter is everything is on the table okay okay uh, only because that would, that would that would uncomplicate the entire situation of how we're uh tax and co-op, each look at each entity as individual, not part of the co-op. And I, I think you solve a lot of problems. But anyway, that's all I want to ask you. So consider that you. when you guys have your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, we will now hear from Lynette Townsley, followed by Victor Starsky. Starting time.
Lynette, you're unmuted. You may start. Are you calling for Lynette Townsley? Yes, we are. Okay, she's on another Zoom, but I am the chairperson of Community Board 12. Lynette is one of my uh, committee members. May I speak in her place? For a quick minute, yes. Okay, then I would, um, like Lynette stated previously, I would make the same request. Can you please come back to Community Board 12? Um, this topic on the tax reform is extremely, extremely um, a dire topic, very serious to our community because we've been hit so severely with the foreclosure process. And we really would like for, um, for you to come back and speak to us and so we can get the community to, to come out as well because a lot of people are not aware of this. And we would like to um, give our input. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I'm Reverend Thorpe from Community Board 12. I am the chairperson. Thank you, um, Reverend. Uh, we'll now hear from Victor Starsky, followed by Rosario Sinisi. Starting time. Thank you once again. Um, big problem here, which hasn't been mentioned. Speculators buy up homes. A lot of these speculators are from out of the country, hiding the money from their governments. They put people in the houses. They pay over over the, the asking price. The people who are selling are getting over over what they deserve. And the young people and the retired people are having trouble uh, buying a house or remaining in a house because the sheerly profit that is going on. Not people like myself and my neighbors who have been on, on the block for 30 to 60 years and we would want to stay, but it's almost gonna be impossible to stay if this goes through. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Uh, we'll hear from Rosario Sinisi, followed by Joanna Rock. Starting Paul time. Uh, Rosario Sinisi, um, you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to follow up on what I had asked before. It was a procedural question having to do with accessing um, the written testimony that's being submitted. Um, could somebody please get back to me and let me know? I realize you may have to consult with others to give me an answer, but I would really appreciate it. Right. We, we, we will. We okay. Will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosario. We'll now hear from Joanna Rock, followed by Yvette. Starting time. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree with that suggestion to look at co-ops the way you look at condos. And I heard someone say that they were concerned about $4,000 a year as an average for their shareholders. Ours is going to be 10,000 to 12,000 in a year when we're at full phase in. So the numbers here are absolutely astounding for middle income and there needs to be a better way to make this more fair. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, we will now hear from Yvette. Hi, I just really want to, thank you. I just want to um, follow up with, with really finding out how do we find out about the assessments? Who is responsible for them? How are they done? And what are the parameters that are used to make an assessment for your property? Um, and who can get back to me with that? Because I really would need to know that information. And right. there's a disparity in how a property is assessed and that hasn't been dealt with. And I'd like to have additional information on that. Thank you so much. Right. So, so th those issues are all um, come out of and, and are responsible from the from the perspective of the Department of Finance. So they will and can get back to you. Um, you know the, the the deliberations we are having here is how to change the law or about how we do these issues going forward. So, th thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Chair Shaw, it appears that no other members of the public would like to testify. So we are finished with the public portion of this hearing. 
All right. So, so obviously, thank you once again for moderating this uh, hearing. You made it uh, incredibly easy for me to chair it. So, so I, I thank you, Amra. Um, I'd like to thank all the members of the public and elected officials who joined us tonight to give feedback on the commission's preliminary report. Your comments are important as the commission develops its final recommendations. As a reminder, the commission will be holding virtual public hearings in the Bronx on June 14th and in Manhattan on June 16th. As I mentioned before, we hold hearings on Staten Island on May 11th and a Brooklyn hearing occurred on May 27th in addition to tonight's hearing. Um, finally, I'd like to thank all the members of the commission for their time tonight and especially the staffs of the city council and the mayor's office for making this hearing possible. Um, so good night, everyone. Have a good evening. And for those that want to watch the Islander um, Boston games, we finished just in time. Thank you.